Rexburg is a beautiful, safe place. As safe as any city built near an old volcano. And its motto is America's family community. And this is where Chad and his wife, Tammy, are raising their family. And then Laurie came to town. Maybe an eruption was inevitable. Chad's wife, Tammy Daybell, returns home after a long day at work, and this 49-year-old librarian is taking stuff out of the back of the car when trouble comes up from behind. Tammy would later post on her Facebook page, a guy with a ski mask was suddenly standing by the back of my car with a paintball gun. He shot at me several times, although I don't think it was loaded. I yelled for Chad, and he ran off around the back of my house. I have no idea what his motive was, and we never spoke, even after I asked him several times what he thought he was doing. So Tammy Daybell stares down the barrel of a gun and manages to survive. But just 10 days later, she winds up dead. The obituary says that she passes away due to natural causes, but at the time, she's actually training for a marathon. It's hard to accept her death. I don't believe it. Husband Chad declines an autopsy before Tammy is buried in Utah, and he receives a $430,000 life insurance payout. I did see Chad that morning, and I don't know how he was grieving. If he was, I do know that he didn't show a lot of emotion. Honestly, I think if I were 49 years old and my wife died unexpectedly at night, I would have asked for an autopsy just to see if there was some medical reason that might be passed on to my children or whatever. But I don't know why that wasn't done. I think that is very unusual and causes suspect. It seems like everywhere Lori is, people yeah, are either dead or missing. Kay Woodcock and her brother Charles were pretty close. They shared a lot of things, including his online passwords. I worked for him a little bit, so he gave me all of that information. In a way, it helped jumpstart an investigation into what happened, correct? You saw some things on a computer? Yes. And what did you see? I saw emails. That email account was linked to the Amazon account. Lori was ordering from the Amazon account still. So I clicked on those and boom, there I see the address they're at in Rexburg, Idaho. Apartment number, everything. The online information that Kay finds is key because now we have an address to where Lori is and a door for the cops to knock on. It also reveals something else. Lori purchases a ring on Amazon under Charles Vallow's account, a wedding ring. And it is this ring that turns up in her wedding photos to Chad Daybell. How does a mother who, up until seemingly a few months ago, loved her children, seemingly would do anything for her children, how does she do a 180 like that? I think that she and Chad together have just, you know, that like they, they just feed off of each other. I know she knows right from wrong. Just admit that. Chad, and the just admit and the that, Laurie. This is nothing about religion. There's no way you can make me believe that in their heart, they honestly believe this BS. One morning, you're going to wake up, and you've, you've got to look at yourself in a mirror and say, oh, my God, what have I done? That day? coming sooner than Lori and Chad know. On November 5th, Lori and Chad are on the beach getting married. But police are methodically uncovering evidence, evidence that suggests foul play. And it all ties back to the newlyweds and Lori's brother, Alex. Evidence like that ring on Lori's finger. You see, the receipt from Amazon shows that it was purchased before Chad Daybell's wife, Tammy's death. After the wedding, the couple returns to Rexburg, Idaho, but the honeymoon is officially over the moment detectives show up to conduct that welfare check requested by the grandparents. And that's when 
things really started getting weird. Detectives speak to Lori's brother, Alex, and Chad. According to police, even though Chad had just married Lori, he acted like he didn't know her very well. I asked Mr. Daybell for Lori Vallow's phone number, and he stated he didn't have it. I found it suspicious because I knew that they were married two weeks prior to my contact with Mr. Daybell. Brother Alex says JJ is fine and with grandparents in Louisiana. Of course, that is a lie. I told Mr. Cox that was unlikely because uh, Kay was the one who originally called in the welfare check. This shell game being played by Lori, Chad, and Alex is designed to distract and deceive. And to a certain extent, it's actually effective because as the clock keeps on ticking and time goes on, it's less and less likely that these children are ever going to be seen again. Rexburg police eventually catch up with Lori at her townhouse. And when she's talking with them, she allegedly lies, telling them that JJ is with her friend Melanie Gibb, when in actuality, Melanie Gibb has no idea where JJ is. According to Rexburg police, once they leave, Lori doubles back and calls Melanie Gibb. And she tells her, hey, Rexburg police is about to call you. I need you to tell them that JJ is with you. This really confuses Melanie. She's put on the spot. Melanie does tell police JJ was never with her. With police closing in, Chad and Lori take off the very next day and they head back to Hawaii. Alex, on the other hand, goes in a completely different direction. He decides now would be a great time to attend a wedding, his own. He picks up his girlfriend, Zulema, and they head off together to Las Vegas. I am Sebastian Salas. I am the owner of A Chapel of Love. I have personally officiated over 100,000 weddings, and I booked the wedding of Alex Cox and Zulema Pestenis. Zulema is a spiritual woman and life coach who claims that her clients will learn that there's a divine power working magic in their lives. Zulema was the one that coordinated and paid for everything. It was all Zulema. At the chapel, Alex demonstrates a little bit of magic himself, making his last name disappear and taking on the last name of his new bride. Alex took Zulema's last name. It was, uh, it was pretty funny, I'm not gonna lie. I have never seen that. That was the first time I'd ever seen a groom take the bride's last name. This is an amateurish attempt by this guy to get the police off his trail, essentially. He's adopting the name of somebody else because it's gonna be tougher for the police to track him down. So in his mind, what he's doing is he is, he's erasing his tracks. This ceremony was about as romantic as a trip to the DMV. Ceremony lasted about three and a half minutes. Alex was quiet, wasn't very involved in the process, and Alex wasn't too eager to add anything onto his package, like flowers for his bride, or even have a picture taken of his wedding. I just wanted to uh, simple, short and sweet, get married and be out of here. The couple returns to Arizona where the newly minted Alex Pistenis begins his new life. Meanwhile, Chad and Lori are secluded in Hawaii when they get a call from their friend Melanie Gibb. Now Melanie has questions and Melanie wants answers. So she comes up with this idea to call Lori and record her and get her to admit that she asked Melanie Gibb to lie. The audio from that phone call is later released by authorities. Hello, sweet Melanie. Hi, Chad. Hey, Lori. Melanie's a little awkward. She doesn't know how to confront Lori, but she says, hey, I want to talk to you about what you asked me to do the other day. I want to talk to you about that lie. Well, I was wondering why you told the police why he was with me. <laughs> I just needed to you have somebody that I, so I wouldn't have to tell them where he really was because they were going to tell Kay where he is. Is JJ safe? He is safe and happy. In the phone call, you get a little bit of insight into Lori's world. You're either for her or you're against her. And once Melanie Gibb starts questioning Lori, 
Lori puts her sort of in this category, you're against me. Never had any idea that you would be the person of all people to turn me. I am asking questions, and I am concerned for you. That is what somebody does when they care. You don't sound like you're concerned. You sound like you're accusatory. You do not sound concerned. You sound pissed off. Rexburg police at this point take a trip down to Utah to this cemetery where they are going to exhume the body of Tammy Daybell. They're in the process of re-examining everyone and everything with a connection to Chad. It was kept quiet. It wasn't a media circus. It was very quiet. Our crews here at the cemetery were here at 6, 6.30 in the morning. There were no onlookers, with the exception of a dozen people from the attorney's office, Rexburg Police Department, several people from the coroner's office. Everything was photographed and uh, Believe it or not, Tammy was back and buried within six or seven hours that same day. It's interesting that Tammy used to sell to cemetery plots out here and keep the records of the cemetery. And, and now we're here doing an interview. It's uh, kind of mind boggling if you really want to think about it a little bit. One day after the exhumation, there's a 911 call, and once again, it involves Alex Cox. 911, where is your emergency? Um, I have uh, a older male here named Alex. I think he's passed out. It's really bad. Come up there, in the back. What is your emergency? Um, I have a older male here named Alex. He's a uh, he just passed out here on the on my, on my bathroom. Till death do us part came a little earlier than expected, and just two weeks after getting married, Alex Cox collapses in the upstairs bathroom of his new bride's home. Zulema's 25-year-old son Joseph calls 911. Is he awake hey, right baby. now? I think he's passed out. Okay, you think he's unconscious? Yes. And now the tables are turned. Instead of Alex dialing 911, a 911 phone call is actually being placed about him. Yo, Alex. Alex. Not, he's not breathing. Zulema's son is seemingly unaware that Alex is now his stepfather. Do you know him? No, it's my mother's boyfriend. And he doesn't even know Alex's last name. Alex's last name. I don't know. You don't know his name? No. Five minutes into the call, Zulema arrives home. And Joseph starts to tell her what happened. It's really bad. Come up there. In the back. Paramedics arrive and rush Alex to the hospital where he's pronounced dead. He is only 51 years old. The moment I found out Alex passed, I had gotten a phone call from Zulema and she was just in shock and I immediately just broke down like it felt like I'd lost my best friend. How could I ever trust somebody the way I trusted Alex? He was like a vault. And his secrets are locked in that vault. So you got this guy who kills Lori's husband, although he says it's in self-defense, and then he's being looked at in the disappearance of these two children, and now he's dead. There's been a lot of false claims that he's a hitman or um, the family killer, and it's just, it couldn't be f further from the truth. Alex has and had a big heart, and he was a man of his word, a man of truth. And police are trying to find the truth about how he died. Zulema told police that Alex was suffering from shortness of breath, and the night before he died, she'd urge him to go to the doctor, but said that Alex had refused. But ultimately, the medical examiner would rule that Alex's death was due to natural causes. Alex is a mystery in life and in death. In fact, his own mother didn't even know he died for seven days. And then we learn later that she didn't even know he'd been married. Sadly, regarding Alex and Zulema, I didn't know they were married until after he died. I didn't know that they had moved back to Arizona. About Alex's death, we had him cremated, which were his wishes, and we had a service for him. 
and we didn't invite anyone to his service that believed he was a murderer. So it was a very small, precious group of us who loved him. On December 20th, 2019, Rexburg police and the FBI issue a press release announcing that JJ and Tylee are missing endangered children. And that is when the story goes national. Now two authorities intensifying their search for two missing children in Idaho. First two missing children and now their mother and her husband are both believed to be on the run. Give me another one, JJ. By January of 2020, JJ has been missing for more than three months. Larry and Kay turn to the public for help. The grandparents of a missing Rexburg child have upped the ante in the search to find him and his sister. They hold a press conference and they announce a $20,000 reward for any information that will lead to finding JJ and Tylee. If you have any information whatsoever, please call the authorities. We want Lori to please start cooperating with the police. But she's not going to start cooperating, so the police are going to have to force her. New developments involving missing siblings from Idaho. Their mother, but not the children, has been found by authorities in Hawaii. On January 25th, Chad and Lori are located in Hawaii by police, and Lori is served with a court order telling her she's got to produce JJ and Tylee within five days. That moment was caught by police body camera. The deadline comes and goes without a peep from Lori. They gave that mother until tonight to reveal her children's whereabouts. But Lori fails to produce the kids. And the mystery continues. Larry and Kay head to Rexburg, Idaho. JJ's last known address. Come on, Kay. Let's just walk down. I can see him running around here. I know how he is. That door would open and, and he would holler pop off. I think I'd die of a heart attack. East Idaho News obtained surveillance footage from a storage facility in Idaho. It shows Lori and a man who looks a lot like Alex making multiple trips to the storage locker in the weeks after JJ and Tylee disappeared. Police search the storage locker and they find a scooter, they find a backpack with JJ's initials, and they find a photo album with photos of JJ and Tylee. What did you think when you saw that? It was like somebody reached into my heart and stomped on it. It, it was like a kick in the gut. Jen and Lori, can you tell me where your kids are? Lori and Chad go on with their lives. Our producer spotted them on their way to church services. Would you tell me what happened to JJ? You know, the grandparents are very worried. The couple doesn't seem too concerned about the outrage that they're enjoying life in paradise while Lori's kids are missing. Lori, tell us where your kids are. Everybody wants to know. It's been five months since JJ was last seen. And now, finally, Lori is arrested. Kauai police say they have arrested Lori Vallow on an Idaho warrant. Lori Vallow was taken into custody without any incident by detectives of the Kauai Police Department. Lori is charged with two felony counts of desertion and non-support of dependent children. And she is held on $5 million bond. Hi, my name is Marcus Warren with ABC News. A few days later, after Lori's arrest, ABC News correspondent Marcus Moore tracked Chad down. My initial goal was just to introduce myself and to convey that I have no preconceived notions. Is there, is there anything that you would like to say to people at all who are, number one, concerned about the kids or concerned about you uh, and your wife? Anything at all you want to say to them? I'm just grateful for any support. We just have to wait for the legal process to work through. And, and can you tell me, Mr. Daybill, are, are the kids are the kids okay? I'll come in. Okay. I will never forget just how nice and approachable and seemingly disarming Chad seemed uh, in that moment. 
Lori leaves Hawaii in handcuffs. She's extradited back to Idaho, where she and Chad reunite in a packed courtroom. All right. Chad has not yet been charged with any crime, but it is only a matter of time before he will join his beloved behind bars. Police will tell you that when Alex Cox died, a lot of secrets died with him, except one. And it's been hiding all along on his phone. We've been covering this story for so long, and throughout every iteration, the question always remained the same. Where are the kids? I think for the public, they wondered why were Lori and Chad allowed to walk free for so long? And now we finally understand why. Investigators needed time. When you look at the affidavit, you see how much work they put into this to try to piece it all together. Is that standard to let people go about their business while the investigation's underway, even if they think murders took place? Yes, and mainly they let that happen because they'll make mistakes typically along the way. They'll make phone calls. They'll go bury something. They'll get rid of a piece of, of evidence. Investigators were able to put together a timeline of sorts. So give us a sense of what law enforcement now believes happened so what happened is that local law enforcement got the FBI involved, and, and rightly so. They bring a lot of support to a case. And there is a team of our unit in the FBI called the Cellular Analysis Survey Team. Now what that is, is that they are very good at precisely marking where your phone has popped up. And it's actually so good that they can put it roughly about 20 feet from where you are. So it's, it's really cool stuff. And so that cell phone location allows for police to really put the pieces of the puzzle together. You can place Alex in Lori's apartment at wee hours in the morning. And then the next thing you know, a few hours later, Alex's phone pings behind Chad's house. It allows investigators to understand where that phone was traveling and then extrapolate from there. Now. You can't say this was Alex the entire time with this phone. You don't know that for certain. But when you start adding it up, you say, this is his phone going from place to place. Then the phone goes back to his apartment. And for investigators, it leads in others to say, who else could have done this? You don't know for sure, but you are sort of making that extrapolation. Kylie, the last she's seen is on September 8th. She disappears. Alex goes over to the apartment early morning hours of September 9th. This evidence is fascinating because it's the only time that Alex's phone is at any period in time in Lori's apartment between the hours of midnight and 6 a.m. Then at about 9.30, the phone pings from Chad's property towards the east end. Then there were the text messages from Chad Daybell at around this same time, correct? Right. According to the affidavit, a short time perhaps after Alex had left the property, Chad then texts his wife, Tammy Daybell, saying, hey, there's something interesting going on by, back by the pet cemetery. There was a raccoon, and I had to end up shooting it, and then I buried it in the pet cemetery. He also mentions burning some stuff in the fire pit. I think he made an excuse that it was going to get wet or whatever, and he wanted to get rid of it. Was there ever a raccoon discovered buried on Chad Daybell's property? No. Let's talk about Lori, about two weeks later, September 22nd. What is she saying, Ryan, to her friends at this point about her children? Well, she's talking about JJ, and she's frustrated. She allegedly mentions to her friends that she thinks JJ has become a zombie. And she uses as proof of that the fact that he's watching TV while he's sitting still and that his vocabulary is increasing. And that's proof that he's in a zombie-like state? Yeah, that this isn't the JJ that she knows. And investigators say that this isn't the only time she's mentioned zombies and her children. Investigators say they have other witnesses who heard Lori Vallow refer to her children as zombies. Right, and this becomes key when you talk about zombies in this context. It's, it relates to 
the beliefs that Lori and that Chad hold as part of this new church called the Church of the Firstborn. Zombies are these people who are always considered to have dark spirits. They were no longer seen as human beings. They were seen as zombies. And so what that does is it tees the ball up in her mind, expressing to other people that these kids are now bad and that who they were, who Tylee was, who JJ was, are not anymore. She's saying her kids have been possessed. Right. Her kids are possessed. Right. Maybe look at it this way, that they have created a different reality. On September 22nd, that very day that Lori was complaining to her friend, something happens. Alex comes over, yes? Alex comes over to the apartment. He takes JJ. He has him for a while, brings him back early that evening. There were house guests there. And so the next day, the house guests get up, and there's no JJ there. So they say to Lori, hey, where's JJ? And Lori allegedly tells the house guests that JJ was acting up. So Alex came back over and took him back in the middle of the night. And then JJ is never seen again. And in this particular story, investigators were able to use Alex's phone again to retrace where he actually went during that period of time. Alex is only seen from his phone in the month of September as being on Chad Daybell's property four times. Two times, he's indoors, inside the property. But on the 9th and the 23rd of September, He's outside in the backyard, according to that phone signal. And those are the only times? Yep. I think one thing that makes this case difficult for investigators is it's hard to know exactly who did what. The signals will tell you where certain devices were. But what's been probably very difficult for investigators, and especially prosecutors in this case, and when people look at this and say, well, why aren't there murder charges? Because you don't know exactly who did what who was involved in actually laying hands on these children. That search warrant was executed at Chad Daybell's house. What did they find? Today, the Rexburg Police Department has conducted a search warrant in residence of uh, Chad Daybell. I wanted to kind of go through what happened on June 9th. That search warrant was executed at Chad Daybell's house. What did they find? The FBI, they gridded off these areas, and they start peeling away layers. This is how you do this. You just don't start digging. It's almost like an archaeological dig to a certain extent. They removed some topsoil that was right underneath the sod, uh, which revealed three large white rocks. Underneath the white rocks was some thin wood paneling. As soon as they re removed the paneling, I could smell the odor of a decomposing body. It was a, what appeared to be a small body tightly wrapped in black plastic covered in duct tape. The investigator immediately recognized that that well could be JJ's hair. So then you move on to another section of the property where the FBI is digging. Again, I think partly based on cell site hits. And they start finding charred remains. And they did exactly the right thing. And the FBI would typically do this, is they bring a forensic anthropologist with them to the scene. There was a melted green bucket. It appeared that the burnt flesh had been placed in. Under the bucket was a partial human skull human remains that were later ID'd through dental records that they matched Tylee. And incredibly, while all this digging is going on, Ryan, Chad Daybell is there initially. While the search effort is happening, he's actually there watching it in real time on the driveway in his car. And according to police reports, he's just sort of there continuously the whole time watching it happen. Then at one point, he moves the car across the street to his daughter's property, watches from there. And then once the remains are found, he decides that's a good time to go for a drive and literally pulls off and starts driving. Obviously, police think otherwise, and they pull him over and arrest him. 
But when you think about that, this is all happening in real time. And he is sitting there watching it happen and then leaves as the remains are found. You have to think those investigators were like, well, two and two equals four here. We know why he's leaving. I don't think he has any emotional connection at all what they were doing in the backyard. I think he's thinking, I'm in trouble. I gotta get out of here, I gotta run, I gotta do something, I feel remorse, I feel emotion, nothing. Yeah, but any social personalities don't think through all that because they don't have any guilt. You know, it's like, he thinks he's slick. And that basically, okay, you found these bodies here, now prove that I killed them. And that's, you know, that's, that is where we are at this point. How sure were they at that point that when they went digging, they were going to find those children. I think they thought they were on the money. And, and another reason is I think they had totally exhausted that these kids were someplace else. They clearly were not with the grandparents in Louisiana. They clearly were not with, with friends in Arizona or, or another location in Idaho. And that this just made the most sense because just let's face it, Chad and Lori both have basically tried to snow the police, you know, deny, 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 and then come up with all these, in my view, ridiculous stories, like Tyvee is at BYU, Idaho. I mean, you can check that in five minutes, you're from law enforcement. It shows you sort of the unsophistication, but perhaps arrogance on their part, that they think they could pull this off. I'm curious because you talk about Chad and his antisocial behavior. That's one person. Now you have Lori, capable of being a part of this and Alex as well. How unusual is it that you would have three people capable of doing something that is unthinkable to almost every human being when it comes to children especially? They take on this attitude that we're superior to everybody else and we live in a different reality and the world's going to change. I mean if they think the world's going to end and there's going to be a second coming and you know they're going to be the king and queen of England after the rest of us disappear, it's such a bizarre that's such a high-risk thing to do. Do you see murder charges coming? I'm surprised they haven't come, but I think the juries are gonna look at these two and say, you two are the zombies, not these kids. The only issue I have with that is prosecutors bring cases that they think in good faith that they can prove. So even if everything looks like a murder charge, they're not gonna bring it unless they think they can prove it. The biggest mystery in this case is who did it? If you believe that one of these three people killed these children, who killed which child? How did they actually do it? So if you have Chad and Lori right there, will you be able to prove to the jury that Chad definitively killed Ty Lee? Not Lori, not Alex. Did Chad do it? Or did Lori do it? Or did Alex do it? That, I think, could set up some problems for the prosecutors. So while I think there could be murder charges in the future, I wonder if they're looking for something more right now to try to figure out how can I pin this on that person based on the evidence I have. If you lay out all of this behavior we've talked about today, I'll, I will tell you working homicide cases for 30 years, it's pretty darn compelling. So what's Lori doing as investigators are digging up Chad's backyard? She's picking up the phone. It was a year ago this month when ABC News went to Idaho with JJ's grandparents. Larry and Kate pull up in front of Chad's house. You see all this open space? What if JJ's right over there? And that actually turned out to be a premonition. Larry was right. That was almost exactly where his grandson's body would be found almost four months later. So as the police and the FBI are digging up Chad's property, guess who calls Chad from jail? It's Lori. This is a fascinating phone call to listen to. You know, it's just this bizarre disconnect between this flighty conversation and the worst scene that could possibly happen outside. Are you okay? And that search would ultimately reveal the bodies of JJ and Tylee. They found Tylee in parts. She had been burned. And then they find JJ. He's wrapped in duct tape, and he's bound from one elbow to the other. Are they in the house? No, they're in the property. They're talking between the lines. They know they're being recorded. They're trying to communicate with each other. Are they seizing stuff? 
this again? Search, searching. Logical. Yeah. So you'll see my true players. Okay. Let's think about what Chad said. This odd choice of words. We'll see what transpires. Is that how someone would react if they had nothing to hide? the FBI and the police show up at your house and they're digging holes in your backyard and somebody calls you, uh, like, or you could be saying things like, the police are here searching my land. I can't believe they're here. Why are they here? What are they doing here? You hear Lori, her only concern is, is Chad. She asks him if he wants her to pray. She wants to know what she can do to help him. He tells her to call their lawyer. What can I do for you? I would call Mark, Talk with him. Hello, you. Should I try to call you later? I don't know. Uh, we can try. Yeah. I'll reach if I can. Okay. I love you. And I'll talk soon. Okay, baby. I love you. Okay. Love you. Good night. That may have been the couple's last phone call. Moments later, Chad is arrested. After JJ and Tylee's bodies were identified, Lori's sister released this statement. We have prayed for the truth to come to light, but we never thought it would look like this. Tylee and JJ are completely irreplaceable in our family. There are no words that can capture this loss. Words are just inadequate. Our family will never, ever be the same. Chad prophesized that the world was gonna end in July of 2020. You have to wonder how Lori feels now that Chad's prediction didn't come true. The desertion charges against Lori were dropped once the children's bodies were found, but she is still facing other charges. As of this moment, no murder charges have been filed against either Lori or Chad. At the end of the day, you want justice. They seem like they would brighten the world, you know, when you look at their pictures. Just for their sake, you hope and pray for justice in this case. We should note that Lori and Chad Daybell are now scheduled to face a jury in July. Two felony charges allege that they worked to destroy and conceal evidence. Both have pleaded not guilty. And Lori Daybell also pled not guilty to contempt of court charges for not producing her children or revealing where they were. And that is the heart of this story, those two children, JJ and Tylee.